meeting for Wednesday, November 28th, 2018, to order. And we do have a quorum. Just a reminder to everyone, please place your electronic devices on uh, silence or vibrate or stun, whichever works best for you. And also, when you speak, would you please address the chair so that we have one person speaking at a time? Uh, and if you would allow to ensure that when we have a speaker, that we give that speaker our undivided attention. Just a couple of reminders also, again, that um, when you indicate that you've moved in the second, I will acknowledge that, and we will restate the motion for clarity's sake. And when you speak, please turn on your, your microphone, and when you're done, please turn off your microphone. So, public comment. Do we have public comment? And seeing that we do not, we'll continue on with our agenda. And I would like for you to look at the summary of actions for the meeting held on October 24th, which are attached. Do I have anyone motion to approve? Motion to approve. And that was... Motion to approve came from who? Chadwick. Chadwick. with okay, City of Pleasant Hill. And second came from Mary, City of Pittsburgh. So I have a motion to approve. I have a second. And with that, I'd like to ask for uh, those who are in agreement to state aye. 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 Those who are uh, opposed, please state nay. And those uh, who will abstain, please state abstain. So I abstain, uh, Yolanda Vega, City of Lafayette. Thank you, everyone. So do your business, and um, please look at your attendance log. I did, and was stunned by my name. I know you guys were laughing at the last meeting. That's okay, I'll laugh too. Incidentally, the uh, candy cane and the Christmas ornament, uh, that's from me. Chris, that's before I read the letter that you made me chair. I want them back. Uh, and we have a couple of, of uh, notations that I made. Uh, Stephen, for the city of Brentwood, Stephen Smith, your end date was April. You plan on continuing? Well, I might as well say now, no, there will be a new member appointed to this committee sometime in January, either of the council meetings. Okay. It's been a pleasure to serve. I don't know if I will be at the January meeting or not. All right, Stephen, thank you for letting us know. So we'll, we'll look forward to that letter. Uh, also, um, Patricia, your, your end date is coming up in March. Do you plan on remaining with us? Okay, so we'll get a letter stating that you will extend, we'll, we'll continue with the, with the committee. Thank you. Um, JP, that's in June, and which is a while away, but just for you to think about it, if you're planning to stay with us, please let us know. I believe you want two or three months' notice. Yeah, if you would, thank you. Also, uh, Mark, who's not here for Melinda, his term is up in February, so I'd like to know if he's planning on remaining. And Larry, your turn is up next, well, January, so are you planning on staying with us? I plan to. Yes. Okay, so if we could get a letter from your city clerk stating that. And Chad, uh, are you planning on remaining with us? For now, yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll take that as a yes. 
I haven't had anyone reach out to me yet from this Okay. Let's take that as a yes. So you can get a letter from your, from your uh, city clerk. Any, any comments about attendance? Have you looked at that? We do have vacancies. We still have vacancies for Antioch, Clayton, Martinez, Pinal, Richmond, Samuel, and, and our large membership. So if you know anyone, please uh, advise Matt, and uh, so we can we can uh, either attend a city council meeting and or meet with their city clerk. Uh, and please look at the calendar for the scheduled meetings of the full board, the administration, planning, and the other committees associated with the Transportation Authority. You might want to highlight that our next meeting will be January 23rd, and then right after that will be February 27th, and then we'll have a calendar of meetings for the rest of the year. With that, I also would like to welcome more members, new and newer members. Welcome to our group. And you've had an opportunity to experience several meetings here. We really are a nice group of people, except when you ask questions. But other than that, we're really very, very nice. So you're welcome to, um, to meet with me and Matt. Uh, on any issues that you might have, any any suggestions you have for the way the meetings are scheduled, and we'd love we'd love absolutely to hear from you. So the first thing on our agenda is a major discussion is to review the city of Clayton's uh, calendar years, their growth program compliance checklist, and that would be for 2016 and 2017, and we do have the representative here, Mindy. Hi, Mindy. If you would come to the podium and and review the, give us a summary of the uh, checklist, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the committee for uh, taking the time this evening uh, to review the city's compliance checklist. Um, my name is Mindy Gentry, and I am um, the City of Clayton representative. I'm the Community Development Director with the City. Um, and just to give you a few highlights of what our compliance checklist uh, goes over is that for the reporting period, the City of Clayton had three general plan amendments. The first one was to increase the uh, base density um, of our general plan in order to have a density um, designation uh, of 20 units per acre, which was a state mandate that the city had to comply with. So uh, we did meet that mandate. Um, the second general plan amendment was for uh, the construction of two single family homes. The previous underlying general plan designation was um, institutional density, which was a designation for uh, a higher level of housing at 7.6 dwelling units to, uh, per acre to 20 dwelling units per acre. And so it actually decreased the, um, the density down to a level to construct uh, two single family homes. And then the last one um, was a general plan amendment to uh, change the way that the densities um, for residential uses are calculated. It essentially um, removed for certain parcels that have sensitive land uses and sensitive land areas such as creeks, um, floodplains, uh, rock outcroppings to remove that acreage uh, from the overall density calculation and then the density would then be calculated off of that, that new acreage. Um, it should be noted that the city collected $11,648 for its offsite arterial uh, program which was a development impact fee. Um, there were no projects during this reporting period that required a traffic impact study. And during the reporting period, the city had two uh, street projects, which was the 2015 Neighborhood Streets, which is a biennial program uh, that the city uh, does conduct. And then the um, second program was the 2016 Arterial Rehabilitation, which uh, repaved and resurfaced um, significant sections of Oakhurst Drive as well as Clayton Road. 
And uh, I'd like to state that the city of Clayton does have a PCI index of 83, which is one of the highest in the county. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that the uh, committee may have. Questions, Kelly? Uh, just reviewing what was provided, how many units of housing were built? During the reporting period? Um, I think there were actually two units that were constructed. Um, there's, and we have currently eight under construction right now. We're mostly an infill community, so we don't have uh, much in the way of uh, current development. And these are just single families? Are there nothing more dense than that or perhaps... I'm going to ask this question because I always do. Um, ADUs or in-law units, anything of that nature to boost density? Those were the two, actually, that were constructed were um, second units. What is the city's uh, impact fees for ADUs or permit fees look like? Uh, two units seems pretty low. <laughs> um, the impact fees, um, they haven't really been revisited in recent memory we are um, actually looking back at our parkland dedication fee right now as well as our affordable housing in lieu fee um, but typically second units we charge half of whatever the development impact fee is for a single family residence and what is that um, I don't have those figures in front of me um, it ranges uh, it I don't know off the top of my head what the total you know cost would be for a single family home for impact fees I do have a question. Um, I've been through Clayton several times. What's the relationship between Cal State and the city? Uh, Cal State's actually in the city of Concord. Oh, it is? Yes. Thank you. No <laughs> Other questions for Mindy? I have a few questions for you, Mindy. Uh, thank you so much for the report. Uh, it was an excellent report and it answered quite a bit. Uh, what do you consider uh, you have here f for uh, affordable housing? What's, what's affordable? I believe those designations are actually defined by the state under HCD. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on family size. So it would be based off of uh, income levels. And I noticed here that you have um, some families are able to rent homes that are already on their property as uh, separate housing. They're able to, if you're able to rent like a second unit, yeah. it, um, if that mm -hmm. answers your question, yes, that is correct. Okay. I want to... Uh, Acknowledge your attachment 1B, um, small letter, Roman numeral 2, and capital B. That's an excellent statement. It's about two or three pages, two pages, and just stating the, uh, the use of St. John's Church. That's really thinking out of the box. That's that was very impressive. The church actually approached the city, and they had a double frontage lot, um, the majority of it that they weren't really utilizing. And um, it made more sense for the northern portion of the property to actually, which fronts on to a residential neighborhood, to um, actually um, subdivide their parcel into two uh, single-family homes. And then the church still maintained the majority of its uh, land. Yeah, I, that map is very telling. The the uh, introduction was very specific, uh, excellent. That was very good. Thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, here's where I found that. That, that second unit, it was under the housing element implementation for 2016. And I think that's um, in, our, in our talking about a uh, right of way for a four lane road uh, on Marsh Creek Road extension near Concord Boulevard. South of Marsh Creek Road extension, Concord Boulevard should be a two. Uh, we sufficient right of way for a four-lane road in case additional lanes are required in the future. On Marsh Creek Road and Concord Boulevard, or what? What? It's the the uh, it's page three. It's um, attachment three, page fifteen, um, letter F of implementation measures. So that's something that you were looking at in 2016? Uh, Attachment 3, is it, are there any other? You circuit, sorry? Uh, what, you said it was Attachment 3? Attachment 3, C, B. Oh, C, okay. Under implementation measures, letter F. I I think those pages weren't included in the in the printed agenda, but were in the in the full checklist that's available oh, okay. for download. All right, sorry, Mindy, I didn't mean to blindside you. That's not my intent. I was just, when I read that, I thought, okay, so you're looking to extend Marsh Creek Road? Um, so I, what I'm thinking, because our general plan, um, ha the circulation element hasn't been updated in recent memory. So uh -huh. um, the south of Marsh Creek Road extension talks about old Marsh Creek Road before Marsh Creek Road bypassed the downtown, mm -hmm. So, um, which we refer to in the old Marsh Creek Road is where it now is the uh, old one, which will, you know, by, bisects downtown, essentially. Right. And then, uh, but there's no plans to um, extend it. It's going to be widened at the south end of town um, once development occurs there, um, which okay. is, you know, scheduled okay. if the proposal goes through. I think that then is all that I have. Yeah. Anyone else? Any other comments for Mindy? No? Do we have a representative of Clayton here? It's a trick question. <laughs> so we don't. So uh, having none, is there a city that is uh, adjacent to Clayton which would like to make a motion for approval for the checklist? Concord. Concord. Concord or the county would be the two. Yeah, okay. Roxanne. So Roxanne makes a motion to accept the compliance checklist for the city of Clayton. Do I hear a second? Second. And that would be uh, JP? Thank you. And so I have a motion to accept in a second. And do I hear, for those of you who accept, do I hear Aries? And those uh, opposed, nay. And many abstentions. So having that, we then will approve this to go forward. And um, so, Mindy, you will be then receiving uh, a letter, a letter all that the planning committee will be meeting December 5th. Is that right? Yeah, December 5th. And, uh, of course, you'll be there. <laughs> uh, there'll be a lot more questions on the checklist, and then once that moves forward, that will be then to the regular meeting of December 19th for the authority. 
And if approved, then you will be authorized your 2017-2018 funds of $262,631. Yay! Great, thank you very much. Don't spend it all in one place. <laughs> one thing there is a, a candy cane and a Christmas ornament there. And since you're the first speaker, you get to choose which one you want. Great, thank you very much. Our right. compliments. Thank you so much. Next on the agenda, we have a presentation on 511 Contra Costa program. And that would be Corinne? Yes, thank you. Hi, Karen. Thank you all for having us here today. My name is Corrine Dutra Roberts. Um, I'm happy to be in front of you all today. Born and raised in Contra Costa County from Pinole. Currently reside in Walnut Creek. I'm joined today with my colleagues Darlene Amaral and Corey Riley. And together we all, um, thank you, we all run the 501 Contra Costa program. 501 Contra Costa is a transportation demand management program. It's countywide. Let's see if I can do this. Forward. Is it this one? It's okay. While we're waiting, Karen, I have a question. Are you accepting questions while you present, or do you want us to wait till the end? Actually, it might be better for you all if you ask questions during the slide because okay. each slide has a different um, Okay, topic. thanks. Um, by starting, uh, show of hands, who's familiar with 511 Contra Costa? Uh, Excellent. 511. Okay. Corinne, I've got a question. Yes. Um, is the program part of the Transportation Authority? Yes. It is. Okay. Yes. So the Transportation Demand uh, Management Program is a part of the Growth Management Plan. And in fact, um, each city is required to participate in this program, and it's one of the items on the compliance checklist. So City of Clayton and all the cities in Contra Costa County um, are allowed to check that box that they participate in a TDM program because of the nature of this program. So this program is connected to all of the RTPCs, the Regional Transportation Planning Committees in Contra Costa County. Um, so that's how we interface with the, um, all of the cities in the county. So to explain to you what 501 Contra Costa is, it's easier to explain what we're not. Uh, we're not 511.org, which is um, the green slide. That's the regional travel, um, real-time traffic information, ride matching services. It's run by MTC. Um, and they also run regional promotions and it serves the entire nine-county Bay Area. This program, 501 Contra Casa, is locally funded and locally um, provided. Um, we offer commuter mobility programs to work sites, to the community, and to schools. Um, as I said earlier, the 501 Contra Costa is supported by all of the Contra Costa jurisdictions, including the four RTPCs. The funding is provided by the Measure J, um, Community Alternatives Line Item, and the Transportation Fund for Clean Air from the Air District. Our mission is to move our planet something uh, away from this. Thank you. And more to this. And we do that by providing um, solutions to the most common barriers that motorists indicate that keeps them from using shared modes of mobility to get to work, from um, walking or biking to work. But the most common thing that people tell us when we meet with them, when we talk about using a commute alternative, is they can't find someone to ride share with. So if you could click down. And we say there are new options out there today. Um, there's new technology options. Scoop, Carzac, Uberpool, Liftline, Waze, 501.org that runs the Ride Match Database program can help facilitate the ride sharing component of travel. The next thing we hear is it's not convenient. And we would say, well, neither sitting in traffic 
um, convenience can be gained by letting someone else do the driving, so carpool, van pool, transit, or ferry. And a lot of people say we need our car, I need my car to get home in the case of emergency. Maybe I have children, I feel like I need to get to them in the case of emergency. We have a guaranteed ride home program that will get them home in the case of emergency. So transit and van pooling also um, are indicated as costing too much. Yet the majority of us spend more than $100 a month on driving alone to work, and that's just driving the car. It th does not include things like insurance, maintenance, um, amortization, all of that. So we say share the ride, save some time, and save some money. So we have some ride share incentive programs that help people make that um, leap from driving alone and trying other modes of transportation. Some of the incentives include, you can click it, mm -hmm. um, the drive less program, which is simply what it states. Do anything but drive alone and pledge to do so, and we'll give you $25 to encourage you to do that. We also have a buy one, get one free transit incentive program, and it's for all the transit operators um, that come into Contra Costa County with the exclusion of BART. So it's County Connection, Tri-Delta, Westcat, Soul Trans, FAST. Um, we also have a Tri-Transit Clipper card to mostly get people acquainted with using Clipper, the system itself, its convenience. Um, we provide a $15 um, Clipper card for people who wish to start using transit. And then we have the Van Pool, Countywide Van Pool Incentive Program, whereby an individual who joins a Van Pool can receive up to $200 a month for the first year. A driver, if he keeps a, a van on the road, can receive up to $1,000 a month um, for keeping on the road. And um, we also provide half off for the van lease for up to the first three months. Next. So a uh, question regarding Clipper card. In order to receive a Clipper card, I think the, is it a $3? And so this is already included in this? Yeah, so it has $15 on it. Um, it. The card has already been purchased. So the $3 is, this has 15 clear dollars on it. So. And then all they have to do is just add to it. Uh, on they have to register it if they would like to. It's mm -hmm. not mandatory. Mm -hmm. um, and then they can just keep auto-loading or using it as they would any other flipper card. Yep. Okay. So if you ride share, bike, or walk to work, we, as I mentioned earlier, you can take a taxi, an Uber, a Lyft. You can ride public transit and to get home in case of emergency, and we'll reimburse your ride. This is a countywide program um, that, that we've been running for several years. Other counties do almost the same thing. So it's a customary program that supports the person who wants to or could ride share, walk, or bike to work. Recently, we ran a, a carpool pilot with the, the technology service provider, Scoop. We can hit the next button. Um, it was a 12-month pilot. It ended last June. Um, it was, Scoop operates for the AM and PM peak period only. It's different than, say, Uber or Lyft in that Uber or Lyft is ride hailing. They'll take you somewhere, they drop you off, and then continue to pick up other rides. Scoop is a system whereby you carpool with someone to work, you park your car, and just like you would any other situation when you drive to work, and then you can pick up a different person and bring them home it, in the evening. So it isn't a midday, it isn't an after hours situation, it isn't a weekend situation. It's for a.m., p.m., Monday through Friday only. So it really targets the commuters. Um, when we ran the pilot, we ran it for the Contra Costa residents only, whereby, you can hit the next one, um, each person received a $2 credit. So the driver received a $2 credit and the passenger received a $2 credit. Um, what we found in the program is it was, it was successful, um, but most of the trips originated in the San Ramon Valley and went down to Silicon Valley, and that's no surprise. Um, so what we plan to do in 2019 is target specific corridors that are congested in Contra Costa County, where most of the trip is traveling in Contra Costa County, like Highway 4, 80. Um, we would really like to do arterials, routes of regional significance, like Ignacio Valley Road, San Pablo Avenue, Danville Boulevard. Um, so that's what we'll be looking for in the future in 2019. Question? Mm -hmm. uh, idea of average cost for each trip? 
on the scoop? Yes. Um, it's, from what we've calculated, it's around $7. Um, and by the way, a scoop report will be coming to CCTA in probably January, February, March timeframe um, with a complete project wrap up. Um, we've also started to look into behavior change with rewards. That's, both, that's basically what we do and what we're finding. We can't build our way out of our congestion, so we have to work on behavior change. And um, the carrot works better than the stick. So we recently launched um, a partnership with Miles, the Contra Costa Transportation Authority, in partnership with 501 Contra Costa. Um, happy to say we're the first public partner for Miles. Um, they will be partnering with other public entities next year, but they started with us. Um, you can click on this slide. So what's great about this app for us is that we're able to reward commuters for the trip that they take. Right now, all of our programs are based on um, honesty, pledging, self-reporting. So our programs now are, if you pledge to use transit, we'll give you an incentive. This allows us to actually reward people or nudge people based on the mode that we're trying to affect. So we're hopeful that this app will bring us um, more tangible data and information about people's commute behaviors so that we're able to reward them at a very key time, time of day and corridor. Um, the way it works is when you, um, you have this app running in the background on your phone, and if you run or walk, the algorithms know that you're doing that, it gives you 10 times the miles. So if you run a mile, well, in this case, if you run two miles, you would get 20 miles built into your account. So it's all miles-based. Um, if you bike, you get five times the miles. If you bus, train, or boat, you get three times the miles. Rideshare, two times the mile. Rideshare means carpool, vanpool, and lift line and Uber pool. Um, if you drive alone, you get one times the miles, and if you fly, you get a tenth. What's interesting about the drive alone, you all may be asking, um, why would you reward somebody for driving alone? I thought we were rewarding people for using commute alternatives. In our business, when we work with individuals who um, are pretty sure that they need to drive alone, they can't get home in the case of emergency, they have to have their car for work, there's all sorts of reasons why people need to drive alone. Probably some of us here feel like we need to drive alone. If we don't have anything to offer you, we don't have any, it, it, the discussion's over. So this way, by having individuals in the system that drive alone, we get to have that in-app dialogue with them to try to keep nudging them. Otherwise, we have no forum by which to stay in touch with them to continue to try to make a behavior change. So that, uh, we think, could be a great place to start um, changing the behavior of people who currently drive alone. The app will also allow us to run local challenges. So for instance, it's Bike to Work Month, May. Um, bike five times um, to work during the AM and PM periods and receive a certain kind of award. And the award can be given by a local merchant um, or some other fashion. So we're allowed to tailor the challenges not only with partners and um, locally, but also the type of reward. Um, question. So I'm also wondering, this app runs in the background at all times for those who download it. So mm -hmm. I get the feeling that the reason you're also wanting to have it reward people for driving alone, if they make their trip five or ten times, you know their commute. You can match it up with a hundred other people and send them a push notification, hey, you should commute with this person. That's exactly what we're looking forward to. Yes. I've, I've got a question. I'm curious about the uh, the flying. Um, <laughs> I mean, even at, at point one, somebody flying a, a round trip to Southern California yeah. back is. Yeah. What we can tell is when they um, arrive at their destination, we can tell how they get to where they're actually going and for their final destination. And in that case, if people are coming especially into the Bay Area, um, we can tell whether or not they're Uber, lifting, biking. We're not going to bike, but uh, use BART. So we can affect the ground transportation on the destination side, which is why it's in there. The app developer put it in there. It's, it's our least, obviously, useful um, at this point, but 
um, at least we can affect the, the ground the ground transportation side of it. Another question. It seems to be you're looking for you have to actually have to commute from point A, fixed point A to fixed point B mm -hmm. on a regular basis. What about all of us that do not go to the same place each day mm -hmm. or, or at different times a day? For the Miles app? Yes. Yeah. So because the, the app does run in the background, um, it, um, it gives me points for hiking. It gives me points for, it gives me miles rather, for um, walking, whether it's recreationally or not. So if I walk the Lafayette Reservoir, it shows up on my app that I've done that. So it's 24-7. Unless you turn it off, it runs in the background. It's 24-7. So it collects all trips, not just a.m. and p.m., not just commute. So we're interested for congestion purposes in a.m. and p.m. Monday through Friday. However, we're also interested in all of the midday trips that occur on our local city streets. One more question on privacy. Since it's running in the background tracking me mm -hmm. throughout the county, what are you doing to protect me from stalkers or whatever? Right. So just, just to be clear, we partnered with the app developer. We didn't build it. Um, we didn't design it. It's their app that, that's available right now in the App Store, and people in New York are using it. So it's, um, just to be clear, it isn't just for the CCTA or 511 Contra Costa. But um, as a public entity, we don't get any data that is, is um, connected to an individual. It's all anonymized. Um, so we can't tell that it was Kareem that traveled from Walnut Creek to Antioch today. But um, their privacy policies address that. It's like, um, it's, it's very similar to Google. Google's tracking you as well on your phone. Very true, and they're also selling it to everybody in the world. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, there is that. <laughs> Okay. Um, actually, I, Colonel, I have a question for you. This side. Thank you. <laughs> Hi there. Um, in terms of scale, how many people reach out to you for one of the services, whether it be ride matching, emergency ride home, et cetera? Um, do you mean reach out to us like in email, phone? Well, how happens? do folks normally reach out to you for, let's just okay. talk about ride matching right now. For Okay. So for ride matching, people, the way people find out about us is through, um, obviously, our website, our social media. Um, we have an e-newsletter with 14,000 um, emails on it, and we send that out once a month talking about our promotions and campaigns. We work in all of the, the public schools in, in the county. We also work with all of the cities. So remember, as I, as I stated earlier, we are connected through the regional transportation planning committees to all of the cities. So we put information out in the city newsletters. Um, we work with city staff um, on our programs. Um, for ride matching, we, we don't have a ride match database. We rely on the regional 511.org ride match database. That's the, the one that MTC uses. So do you have any sort of success metrics that you track to know how often you are able to match people? Um, we don't have that. MTC has that. Um, I can get that information for you. Well, so who, who are you going to sort of be referring to the Miles app or it's one, of your other, one of the other services for? Is this just going to be everyone or folks who you can't match up otherwise? For everyone. For everyone. So the Miles app is a multimodal, you know, it's a multimodal app that allows us to um, affect all modes. So if we want to encourage bicycling in the summer months, we can do that. If we want to encourage carpooling, we can do that. So eventually what Miles will probably do, as most app developers do, um, is create connectors to other apps. So right now the Miles app has a connector to Lyft, for instance. So within the app, you can find people to ride share with using Lyft and Uber. So besides just uh, the actual ri ride share matching, mm -hmm. how about for like the emergency ride home? Like how many people avail themselves of that? Oh, uh, okay. Are you, you're talking about the programs that we run, how many people avail themselves of, okay, of our programs. 
All right. Um, so for the Daring to Ride Home, I'll let Corey answer that. Hi there, Corey Riley. I manage our Guaranteed Ride Home program. I don't have the exact numbers uh, on, on me right now, but we have about 3,700 uh, active users that are registered with the Guaranteed Ride Home program right now. And uh, I would say that in the past, uh, this up until this point this year, we've had about 200 new registrants. Uh, and we've probably processed, I would estimate, around uh, 50 reimbursements in the first half of this year. So uh, as far as, you know, effectiveness of programs, it's really, you know, people will stay in our database for many, many years until they need that emergency ride home. And so it provides a lot of, you know, peace of mind, and it's really not a lot coming out of our pockets. It has a good, you know, cost-benefit ratio for us. 50 reimbursements for the first half of the year? Uh, I would say roughly that, yes. Are you are we doing anything to sort of just, like, make – people more generally aware of the, the service? Or? We're always trying to do outreach. I just met this morning with the Richmond uh, Chamber of Commerce CEO um, talking about ways that we can uh, promote that program more uh, to their businesses so that they can push that out to their employees. We would love to help spread the word on it. I think that even if you only occasionally get a ride from someone or only occasionally bike or only occasionally take transit, you should be signed up because if that one time that you're there, I mean, I think anybody should really be uh, registered in Contra Costa. Just, just one last question. Sorry, I put you on the hot seat here, but like, do you have any targets or goals for 2019 for um, adoption or usage? You know, we don't have any targets or goals uh, right now, but we're always looking for ways to promote the program. Thank you, Corey. You might want to stay right there. <laughs> um, okay, so the. Um, we also ran a challenge campaign. We've been doing this for, uh, I think it's, this is the third year. And it's a three-week promotion that participants, um, participants can text their commute mode in the morning and in the evening. So every morning and every evening when people sign up for this program, they get a text to them that says, how did you commute to work today? You press the number that corresponds to the mode and you're able to basically record how you, how you got to work. Um, you get one point earned for each clean air trip. And from the program, the people, with the, two, the people that had the highest amount of clean trips received $100, and there was two people that did that. And people who achieved at least 30 clean trips were eligible to receive $50. And people who achieved at least 15 clean air trips got $25. And... Um, we also operate a Discover and Go program. This is, I think, in its fifth year. Who's heard of Discover and Go? Anybody? It's a, it's a library program. Library program. This is a great program from the Contra Costa Library. Um, let me go hit the next one. So what Discover and Go is, is you go into the county um, library website, and you maybe you want to go to the, the SF MoMA. And the library will offer tickets to select venues in the Bay Area that are reduced or free. Cal Shakes, Lindsay Wildlife Museum, Lusher Theater. Um, you all should really take advantage of it. So when you go onto the, the website and you book an event at a venue, if that venue is bartable, and bartable by definition is by our definition, of it, is it really logistically bartable, those select sites um, will serve the individual a notice that says you could receive a free BART pass to get yourself to the venue instead of driving. So this is that, um, this is that recreational trip, not the AM, PM work commute trip. This is the recreational trip where we're trying to encourage people to use transit rather than driving. Um, they receive a $15 BART ticket to 500 people. It began in 2012, so six years ago. It runs for about three months, and it's valid for residents, Contra Costa residents, that have a valid Contra Costa County Library card. And the library staff check that, and that's how they know that the BART ticket, that the person's eligible to receive a BART ticket. So these are all examples of ways we're really trying to um, encourage people at every step to take a commute alternative whenever possible. So one of the ways we outreach um, 
and get the, get the word out is through our employers and through our agencies. So we, we all go to, out to our employers and do on-site events. We participate in their benefits fairs and talk about the programs. Um, we provide tailored programs for employers. So if an employer is moving relocation, we'll come in and develop a program for them to help them start off on the right foot by using mass transit or carpooling. Um, we also provide support to employers who have to comply with the Bay Area Commuter Benefits Ordinance. So that's an ordinance that's set up by the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, whereby if you have 50 employees anywhere in the Bay Area that are full-time employees, you have to register your work site um, and comply with this ordinance, which basically means you have to offer uh, one or many um, benefits to your employees that encourages community alternatives. Green question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> do you do you approach uh, government agencies as well, mm -hmm. or are they exempt? No, we approach government agencies, and they're not exempt. Oh. Um, we also provide support for bicycle parking infrastructure, so bike racks, bike lockers, and electric vehicle charging infrastructure. And as I said, mentioned earlier, um, one of the ways we outreach is through the e-newsletter. We participate in regional events and promotions, so we're we're heavy lifter of Bike to Work Day um, for as long as I can remember. Um, many, many years ago, um, 501 Contra Costa coordinates all of the Energizer stations in Contra Costa County for Bike to Work Day, and we have over 60 Energizer stations um, every year, so it just keeps growing and growing. So we partner with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission with bicycle coalitions with the Air District um, for these regional events. And then we do heavy social outreach as well on social media. Um, we also assist jurisdictions with developer entitlements. So as you heard earlier, when a project comes forward that creates more than 100 peak hour trips, uh, we assist the developer in the city in a TDM plan or TDM measures that they could use. And the next one. And we partner with our jurisdictions on a regional and sub-regional TDM planning level, such as bringing shared mobility to specific corridors. So if the city has a need, um, they come to us and say, hey, we, we could really use this help on XYZ corridor or on the Richmond Bridge or um, you know, on 680 or something. We will run targeted um, TDM campaigns, if you will, that gets out what they want. If they want more bicycling, we'll we'll launch a bicycling program. If they want more carpooling, we'll launch a carpooling program. And um, one of the ways that we try to leverage Bike to Work Day every year is through local programs, um, working with the community. Again, this is outside the AM and the PM commuter um, trip situation. We run a summer bike challenge whereby people are challenged to bicycle around town, get to know their town by bike instead of a car. And they can come to certain events and get little treats for doing so at a certain time. It runs from around June to August. It's great with, uh, for families and children who have some time in the summer to go exploring. Um, and we started this around 2012, so we're hoping to grow it in the f and continue to grow it in the future. And go to the next one. And we also work with K through 12, as I said, schools and colleges. So um, we have free public best passes for K through 12 students and some college students. Uh, we offer three per household. It's an annual program, so it ha this program happens annually. And we also have uh, college transit, uh, again, a $15 clipper card for college students. All trying to encourage students, especially young youth, to start learning how to use different modes of transportation before they become drivers. Corrine, do you have, oh, sorry. Do you have numbers for how many um, are taking advantage of that uh, that program? Yes. So for the K through 12 program, we have countywide collectively around a thousand, more than a thousand students. Is that right? Thirteen yeah, hundred yeah. yeah. um, students, uh, families. You could probably divide that by a factor of two because you know you can get three per household. Um, we are um, currently, you know, we give out. Uh, the paper passes. Um, so we've been working for years to see if we can do something different with maybe Clipper 
maybe other options that could be more accessible to people rather than the paper passes. Um, we're still working on that with the transit operators. So we work in tandem with Tri Delta Transit, Westcat, and County Connection on that program. So the future opportunities for transportation in general, and especially for transportation demand management, is um, the bike and scooter share. Um, electric is probably where we'll go. Car share, shared and connected autonomous vehicles, mobility on demand, electric vehicle charging hubs, goods movement, and uh, planning policy. So we're we're hoping to work with planning policy whereby we work with parking minimums when we can and work on TDM programs for developments as well. Uh, quick, quick question. Um, how can you, the sort of like municipalities around the county help raise awareness of these programs? Like how can we be useful to you? Great question. Thank you. Um, you can be useful to us when, um, when projects come forward and your planners review them. It's always very, very helpful when the planners refer them to 501 Contra Costa staff. So if there was a gap, I would say that's probably it, and that would be the strongest way that you all could help us, and I appreciate the question very much. Um, as a practitioner, I would like to say that a revision of the TDM ordinance, the countywide model ordinance, um, could be beneficial. Um, that has a lot of moving parts. It's connected to a lot of documents. Um, I don't have the power to make that happen. It has to go through a process, but I think that's needed, and um, Contra Costa County wouldn't be the only county working on that right now in the Bay Area. Is that fair to say, Matt? <laughs> okay. I guess also in terms of just increasing public awareness, do you guys have press releases, social media presence? Yes. What should we be telling the city hall to repost? Like what yes. are the things like that we can do? Uh, that? Follow us on Twitter. Um, everything that we post on Twitter is germane to transportation, obviously. Um, it's not always local. It's not always what's happening in Contra Costa County, but it is always relevant and useful to someone in the Bay Area um, who needs to get around. Um, follow us on Twitter, retweet, repost our Facebook. Um, talk about our, our student transit ticket program, which, was, which is very, very popular. Um, elected officials like that program a lot. It's a, it's a mom and apple pie situation. Um, I, I think that's probably the lowest level thing that's so easy and no cost associated with that. That would be very, very helpful. When we put out a press release, pick it up. Um, so this is our website. Obviously, the screenshot was taken um, a, a week or so ago. Um, and uh, basically, the website is the one-stop shop of everything that 501 Contra Costa does. Um, our bike mapper is front and center. So the bike mapper is a, is a um, desktop-based uh, origin destination bike mapper. So put in your origin, put in your destination, and it will give you three options for hill tolerances. So if you want the flattest route, or if you want a route with mostly bike trails, or you want to get to the fastest way, it'll give you the three different options, and it'll give you your hill, hill tolerance. Again, it's only for desktop. It's not an app. Um, and we have air quality postings on the website. You can find out how to reach any one of us on the website, um, and about all of our programs are on that website as well. So speaking of, um, you mentioned the bike lockers, um, and I noticed there's bike lockers at all the BART stations. Mm -hmm. I've never used one. Um, is that something that you manage, or are they outside of existing existing locations where, where they are? So our role with bike infrastructure is to fund it. So we help jurisdictions purchase and install the, the apparatus. We don't physically manage them. Okay. So it's usually the property owner that manages it. So BART, BART manages it. If there are bike lockers you know, for this building, the building manager or somebody here manages them. So what we do is use our funds to give a little bit of a stipend, an incentive, a mini grant, if you will, um, using our air district funds to, to property owners and jurisdictions who wish to put them in. 
So I noticed in Danville there at the, one of the park and rides off of um, Sycamore, there's a number of bike lockers there. So that would be the the city of Danville that uh, I got those? Okay. Right, the, the town of Danville. Town, contacted, yeah. Um, <laughs> contacted me to um, have those, like, um, those bike lockers installed. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. To those were your funds? Yes, that was through the funds that I oversee for 501 Contra Costa. What what is that uh, reimbursement or stipend? Is there like a percentage? How does that process work? Because I think like the building I work in is six stories. There's a lot of people there. There's no where to put a bike outside. I think most people take you up the elevator into their office if they're worried about it. Mm -hmm. There's no charging infrastructure there. How does it maybe someone like me approach the building owner or person in charge? Be like, hey, you need to work on this. It's just. As that, you go to your the building um, manager or whomever and say, you know, I'd really like to have secure bicycle parking, um, you know, at this building. And then they can contact 501 Contra Costa to see how we can support them financially with that. Um, the way the program works now is basically the owner does the, you know, we can help them with research. We have a list of, of vendors. Um, they pick what they want. They, because, you know, sometimes there's architectural guidelines. So they pick the, the unit, the, the apparatus that they want, and then we fund it. They install it. They manage it. What is the level of funding that you all provide? Is it like a percentage or? Right, right now, um, we, <laughs> so far no one has asked us for, you know, oodles of money. Um, it's around $1,000 a piece, $2,000 a piece. Um, so for bike infrastructure, it's a, it's a, um, we don't get asked for it a whole lot, sadly. Um, the Air District has, because it's Air District funds that we use that come down to the county, um, they have guidelines, and we stay in, we try to stay in line with those guidelines. So the EV charging units, for instance, um, depending upon the level of the charging unit itself, whether it's level two or level two plus, the Air District allows three thousand dollars for that so that's what we match as well a charging unit itself costs around ten to thirteen thousand dollars or up so it's not the whole it's not the whole amount but it gets you really really close so and, that, and we have a form on our website for people to request bicycle infrastructure so you can just go there and fill it out and it'll get routed to the right person Yes. So I have a, um, I was thinking about what you were saying, and I chair the Contra Costa Workforce Development Board. I'll be contacting you to make a presentation to us. That is, uh, we, we represent all the counties in Contra Costa, and one of our concerns is transportation provided for our veterans, mm -hmm. for our second chance. Uh, our, our um, members of the community who have been incarcerated and are receiving a second chance and their money and their funding is rather restricted. Also for areas that uh, that are uh, remote. <laughs> you know, we tell, we're told that there's bus routes to these particular um uh, websites and um, no, there's not. Well, yeah, every two hours. So, and to me, that's not. So, I'll be contacting you for that. The other thing is that the uh, Lafayette Library uh, in, gets involved with community issues, and they have an excellent turnout. So, if you want, I can talk to the uh, the director of the Lafayette Library to have you kind of make a presentation to the city. Happy to do we that. have a flyer in La Miranda, which covers Lafayette, Moraga, and Arenda. It's called the La Miranda Times. I know one of the one of the uh, reporters, and I'm happy to reach out to her and ask her to do a a uh, an article that would that would at least tickle people's uh, interest if they've already seen it on their app or what have you for them to go back and do some uh, more extensive research on it. This is a fabulous program. I really don't want to see it to be the best kept secret or for just 
uh, just a small amount of people who are having a great time with it. Hooray for them. But uh, you know, in addition to this group, there are other, there are other venues. So, yeah, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you all very much. We yeah. appreciate it. Take that candy cane and the ornament, whichever is left over. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. So the next item on the agenda is uh, our committee reports by our members. And I want to take this opportunity to once again welcome our NOAA members. And we have a new member count. Uh, I saw you being sworn outside, so you're really new. Uh, and uh, so welcome here. And um, and I want to thank all of you for naming me chair. That's not true. I don't. But yeah, yeah, I do. I do. Uh, thank you for naming me chair. I appreciate it. Uh, and I will tell you in just in a thumbnail, uh, I was changing a light bulb uh, almost four months ago. And I changed the light bulb, and the next thing I knew was... An hour and a half later, I opened my eyes. I was flung across the room. I didn't realize that at the time. I've been out for an hour and a half, and I have uh, the electric current blew out of my head right up here. So I'm lucky it didn't take my left eye with me, and I'm very grateful I'm alive. Not my turn. It's really clear it's not my turn. I'm happy to be here with you guys. I, I always enjoy coming. Um, you know, sometimes I speak tongue in cheek, but I'm really happy to be here. So, um, I got to know if, uh, Matt, would you tell us how many more checklists do we have for to review with this group? That's a very good question. We're actually taking this item to our planning committee uh, next week. Uh, we generally give them a status update on the on the uh, on the checklists in usually February or March, because uh, as you may know, or, and for the new people, um, all the checklists are due uh, to us by the end of June of the odd year, 2019. And um, as of the Clayton checklist, che Clayton is only our fourth out of 20 checklists that we are set to review uh, through this checklist cycle. So I moved, I kind of made an executive decision to move that item up three months um, so the elected officials and our planning committee members know that their cities are, we're sitting on their money basically, um, that they need to get their checklists in and that you guys have a three checklist per meeting limit. Mm -hmm. So that means some of these people may have to wait several months after the end of June uh, to get their money. So, um, yeah, so I, I can tell you we, we do have another checklist. I have another checklist sitting on my desk, so you'll see that in January. And I have, another, I have a draft on my desk as well. So we'll probably have at least two in January. Okay, thank you. So I would like to encourage uh, the citizens to uh, contact your city clerk. I think that that's probably the best person I used to contact the mayor, please. The city clerk is better. They're, they're the ones who can just sort of like nudge them. And just a reminder, because they'll, they'll contact the uh, planning manager for, the, for your particular city. And as Matt said, let them know that they're sitting on money. And so. if any of you have uh, want to know exactly how much money we're sitting on for your city, Feel free to call me or email me, and I can send you that exact figure. Yeah. Clayton's 230 some odd thousand is probably the lowest in the county that goes up to in the millions yeah. for the county and larger cities. Matt, if I may. <laughs> it is mkelly, M-K-E-L-L-Y, at ccta.net. What are the two that you've got sitting in? So um, I have uh, San Ramon. I have an official submittal from San Ramon, and I have a draft submittal from Antioch. 
Would you review for the new members which have been uh, reviewed and approved already? Yeah, so unfortunately for our new Hercules member, he missed uh, their checklist by a month. That was last month. Uh, prior to that, we had Pittsburgh, uh, Brentwood, and who am I missing? Pittsburgh, Brentwood, Clayton, Hercules. That's it. Thank you. So, uh, any reports? Uh, Kent, before you came, I had everybody uh, just sort of fess up and let me know if they're planning on ex renewing their membership here on the committee. So, we did have some people stating that they would not be returning. Uh, you, on the other hand, you'll be returning. So, yeah. All right, so Stephen. Okay, well, my report is one of the attachments. I'll just mention a couple of things. Having watched this whole process for several years, the first item, Hercules has really had to struggle back from a major breakdown in governance there former city manager turned out to be really dishonest. And they have really done a heck of a job to pull their city back together and move this forward. They want to set up an intermodal transportation center for the region and have been working at it piece by piece. They're to the point now where the uh, Amtrak and BNSF are starting to do the preliminary planning for what it would mean to the schedule to add a rail stop on the capital corridors in Hercules. So this was another step in uh, their long struggle back. The only other thing I will answer a question, well, the second one that's a real Gordian knot, and after kicking around for 20 minutes, the uh, authority board didn't have anything to offer. There's a very complicating factor between the uh, San Ramon and the county and the private landowner, which I believe is a uh, union, either the labor, I think the laborers union. Extending the ULL is not something that gets done lightly. You can do it fairly easily up to 30 acres, but this is a proposed annexation of around 360 acres. And this is probably going to uh, go on for several months. And the last thing I might mention, and I don't have a lot of details on this, but it beginning to look like it's the inner city representatives versus the suburban representatives on MTC and ABAG about somehow making transportation authorities more responsible for housing. The most um, contentious part appears to be what they call the CASA initiative. Our representatives on MTC and ABAG are in the minority and resisting this, but it looks like it's moving forward and it's probably going to become, in future months, more of an issue. They're still trying to find out to, Something that can be achieved by consensus, but if not, it's it's going to be uh, difficult. So I'm able to answer any questions on this. It's been enjoyable. I think I've done this for about past six or seven years, actually doing a written report. I started out by just doing it orally, but then it just seemed to make more sense to write it down. 
So as I said before, I, I have enjoyed my service here. I'll have to go back and look, but I think it will have been almost 10 years that I've been on this committee. But I have increased responsibilities now as actually being an elected fire board member out there as of next month. Congratulations. You will be sorely missed. Uh, personally, personally, I've always appreciated the the reports. They've always been uh, thorough, uh, informative. Uh, I marvel at at the time that you invest in them and share them with us. I'm I'm very grateful. Anybody else want to do those reports? Think about it. So, um, Kent, um, what I will do is I'll have everyone just sort of introduce themselves, just very briefly go around. So, new members will start with Patricia. Hi, I'm Patty Bristow, and I represent Contra Costa County. Um, I I'm always been on here for four years now. Um, I live in Byron, and um, I do do a report every now and then on what's happening out in Byron. And our, our my big concern for East County is, of course, the airport connector that uh, is finally a, a pretty high priority here now. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brad Powells, and I'm from Hercules. Um, I've uh, lived in the Bay Area for about five years, um, and I've seen sort of like Hercules even claw itself back from the brink of bankruptcy. And what I'm here to do is just try and like help them continue our progress, you know, make, make way on sort of the Intermodal Transit Center, hopefully, um, and understand the transportation issues um, in the area. Um, when I'm not here, I do uh, work uh, down in Mountain View. Um, but, you know, if anyone ever wants to grab coffee, I'd love to get better acquainted uh, and get to know all of you. So thanks. I'm Kent Moriarty from Panol. Uh, this is all totally new to me. So sorry for being late, but I appreciate you taking time to introduce yourselves and uh, familiarize me with how you all work. Chadwick Weiler, City of Pleasant Hill. Uh, actually, my two years coming up since I was appointed midway through, hence my comment earlier, I don't know what the process is for renewal or if the city will just automatically reappoint me or what. Well, Matt will help you with that, but it's contacting the city clerk. And so they will write a letter. But uh, I would ask you to connect with Matt for that. And just a note, if your term expires, we we won't turn you away at the door. We <laughs> keep coming um, until we get something official from the city. It's kind of the informal rules we play by here. Steve Smith, outgoing representative from Brentwood. I believe I showed up first in 2009, and it's it's been an experience. It, um, one of the things I'm hoping to hear from Matt is whether he knows when the ribbon cutting is definitely scheduled. In my 10 years being there, I've watched the uh, Highway 4 project, you know, almost from the beginning. That's been a long, hard struggle to expand Highway 4 out there. And was only, I believe, um, the latter part of last month that we finally got the final element of the what we call the Balfour Interchange operational, which is the last major interchange to be done on the Highway 4 expansion. So that is now a uh, no longer an at-grade interchange, but it's you know the uh, 
latest in a long list of improvements extending from really the Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Bay Point Station all the way out into Brentwood. It will be interesting to see if we get going on a precursor to the Brentwood Ebart Station being a uh, park and ride lot at the location where it is anticipated the next Ebart Station will be. But nobody knows how long that's going to take. Okay. Um, my name is Larry Weirich. I'm representing Pittsburgh. And if memory serves, and at my age, sometimes it doesn't, but I, th I think I began serving here uh, in 2004, which probably makes me the longest tenured person <laughs> on this committee. Um, it's been enjoyable. Uh, we've gone through a lot of uh, different representatives, and we've lost a few along the way. Uh, from Clayton, I remember Charlie, and uh, there's been two or three others. Well, we're old. It happens. During my time here, uh, we've seen quite a bit of progress uh, in thoroughfares through Pittsburgh. Uh, there's been uh, the uh, expansion, the widening of Highway 4. Uh, there's been the EBART uh, developed and now running. Uh, originally, we were not going to have a railroad uh, avenue station for BART, and we managed to make that happen. Um, there still remains uh, another congested route called, you know, it's Buchanan Road, and uh, hopefully, you know, in the not too distant future, uh, all the all the plans will come to fruition with an extension of James Donnellan Boulevard uh, and uh, reach uh, Ignacio Valley uh, Road and uh, take a lot of traffic off of uh, Buchanan Road and give residents in that area a great deal of relief. Um, let me pass this along now and welcome to all you new members. Thank you. And I have an announcement to make too. I'm Roseanne Nieto and I represent Concord. And um, I have been blessed by being called on a mission for the Mormon Church. And I'm going to Salt Lake the end of this month. I hope I can, I can get somebody to come in and sit on this has been very interesting. My history is the Concord Naval Weapons Station. I've been working on that for 15 years. It's my baby, and I stress over taking this calling because of that project. But I promised me to have a hole in the ground when I got back, so we'll see. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, um, I'm Bruce Yao. I represent, represent the city of El Cerrito, and I also am one of the newer members on the, on this committee. Uh, Larry Rosenberg, uh, representing the town of Moraga. And we work very closely with Lafayette and <clears throat> Arundel. We're sort of a three-city joint group, so what affects one city is affecting the other city, and. Um, Roseanne, I want to apologize to you that I moved um, Cal State into Clayton. <laughs> I thought it was always in Clayton, but um, obviously it's in Concord. <laughs> anyway, uh, I've, as I said, I've been on the uh, committee for a little less than a year. I'm learning a lot, but I'm impressed with the senior members here, senior um, in their knowledge, and uh, they're teaching all of us good information, as well as the staff. Thank you, staff, for your patience with us. 
I'm Ken Strongman, and I represent the City of Walnut Creek, where I am on the I'm Vice Chair of the Transportation Commission. And I'm looking forward to working with this committee, and I'm also looking forward to the tour of the automated car at some point. <laughs> Hi, I'm J.P. McDermott. I'm a um, representative for the town of Danville, and I think this is my second term here. And um, I also have learned an incredible amount about transportation and how it impacts every aspect of our lives. What's exciting to me is the future and using technology and, and what our executive director, Randy's vision, has been um, – very inspiring and, and exciting. So um, I, too, am anxiously waiting for that field trip. What, what field trip? Anyway, my name is Yolanda Vega. I chair the Citizen Advisory Committee. Um, and I have been a member since 2006. I live in Lafayette, and I've lived in Lafayette since 1982, raised my two boys there. I'm extremely active in the community, and I vice chair the Contra Costa Workforce Development Board. I, I chair the volunteer committee for the Blue Star Mothers uh, for their veterans at the Martinez Hospital. I'm president of the American Gold Star Mothers Chapter for Contra Costa County, and I am part of the mentorship group for Martinez Court for our veterans who have been incarcerated and are receiving a second chance. And I sleep sometimes, but most of the time I don't. And I'm just glad to be here and to be alive. So, welcome everyone who is new and new there. And Rosanne, I wish you so much happiness in your new adventure. I wish you luck because that, that's up to God. I wish you happiness and I hope that when we see you again, which we will, I know we will, you have wonderful stories to tell us. I'm from Salt Lake originally and it's, it's, I'm glad to be going back there to do my mission, but at the same time, they could have used me other places, which would have been fun. I, you know, I, Salt Lake, I've been there before. <laughs> you know, it was, it was good news and it was kind of like, oh, but uh, the job is going to be very interesting because I'll be working with the president of the church and the apostles. And so it will be a very interesting job for me. So, Matt, uh, if you can give us a brief summary of what's happening with our commission. Okay, so um, let's see. First of all, uh, since Stephen mentioned it uh, earlier, um, there is uh, going to be a pretty significant uh, ribbon cutting of the SR4 Balfour interchange, which if you haven't been all the way out to uh, South Brentwood lately, it's a pretty impressive project. Um, and it's been under construction at least two years now, I think. Um, the whole, you know, the whole bypass has been going for 10 or 15 years now, and it's kind of the, the, the capstone on, on the, the current plans. Um, so, uh, you all are invited. It's going to be, oh, I just had my calendar, oh, the 10th property tax day um, of next month. That's Monday the 10th. As soon as we have our invitation ready, I just spoke to Lindsay this morning. She's finalizing all the details. We will send that out to the entire uh, committee. So you're all welcome to attend, attend if you want. Um, and uh, it's going to be at 10 in the morning. Um, at the John Muir Hospital parking lot there adjacent to the interchange. But we'll get you all the details if you're free and, and want to attend. Um, and so it should be a fun event. Um, Randy will um, loves those types of events and usually makes them pretty entertaining. Um, so we have an, another uh, piece of good news that I'm going to let uh, Fifi share with you. 
Before I share the good news, I do want to remind everyone um, to sign in on the sign-in sheet at the front table. Um, we do have required certifications for the CAC, um, AB123 and 1661. If you have not completed that yet, please see me after the meeting and we can arrange for that. Also, if you need parking validation after the meeting, I can provide that as well. On to the good stuff. Um, we have made progress with the Gomentum station visit. We have two potential dates that we are looking at. The first is uh, December 12th, and the second is the 20th. We will have a second visit scheduled sometime in January. Um, we are limited on the number of individuals that we can bring in with us, which is why we will be doing two separate visits. So I will be sending out a poll sometime uh, in the next week or so to gather um, availability from everyone, and then we will uh, schedule a time and move from there. <laughs> yes, you, we deserve that. Or we don't deserve applause. We Sorry for making this take so long. Uh, there were a lot of issues. And just want to tell the new members, Gomentum Station, uh, we, the rest of the committee has been uh, briefed on, the, on what's going on out there, but it is our um, autonomous and connected vehicle test bed. It's uh, um, the large, I believe it's the largest in the country right now. Um, and we've got several uh, folks out there that are testing different types of vehicles from anywhere from um, automated passenger cars to automated uh, trucks to automated shuttles um, and a whole lot of other things going on out there. There's tunnels, railroad tracks. It, by the way, it's at the old uh, Concord Naval Weapons Station, um, the part that isn't being developed. Um, so there's, it's like a city out there. There's railroad tracks, tunnels, uh, roads in all conditions. So it's really good for uh, the testing of automated vehicles because they get to test in real world conditions and not some, you know, perfect, uh, perfectly recreated uh, scenario. So, um, we're going to get you out there. Um, so hopefully, uh, if you can't make the December date, we'll get you out there in January. Um, so thanks for that. So if there are no further comments, then I would like to wish everyone a wonderful holiday season, whichever way you celebrate it, safe and happy with your family. This meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>